Hi everyone, it's Jason at the Centre for Computing History. Welcome to our lair. Um, today we've got a video for you about a donation that's just recently come in. It's a bit of a mega haul. You'll see we've got lots of BBC Micros and they're various different types. We've got BBC Masters, BBC Micros, the cub monitors that go with them. But there's also a couple of uh, Sinclair Spectrums. I think there's an Amiga in here somewhere. Um, lots of paperwork, discs and all sorts of other bits. Um, some early PC stuff. Um, and it's been said to us that actually people would like to see this stuff as it comes in. So not just as it goes into the collection um, and once it's been on the website, uh, but actually as it comes in and what we do with it. Um, and just to see really what you know, happens behind the scenes at the museum. So that's what we're going to do. Now this particular donation uh, has been given to us en masse uh, in bulk uh, so that we can do it up and we can sell it to generate funds for the museum. Uh, as you might know, with coronavirus at the moment, um, things are a little bit tricky for the museum. It's not open. Uh, so donations like this help us generate funds. So we'll do it up, get it working again, put it on eBay, um, and people can buy them and have them as their own part of their own collection. So it keeps this stuff going. But it also helps the museum quite a lot. Now, as you can see, this isn't in the most tip-top condition. Uh, it's been stored in a shed um, and in back rooms, and it's got very, very dusty. Um, but we're just going to take exactly what we find, um, have a look through it, and see where we go from there. So this is a chance to have a look and see what comes into the museum. A little bit behind the scenes for you. So let's take a look at what we've got. Um, like I say, very Acorn heavy, lots of BBC Micros, but there's variations on the BBC Micro here. So let's just take a look um, at some of those. We'll start off with this one over here. So this is a BBC Master computer. What's interesting about this is the fact that it says BBC Radio on top. Um, so this has been taken from um, one of the BBC studios, I would imagine, somewhere around the country. Um, they've been marked up as BBC uh, Radio, as you can see on the top there. So this is the later version of the BBC Micro, which had disk drive support built in. The original versions didn't. Um, and it had the numeric keypad on the side um, and a few other tech features. So let's have a look inside. So. With the BBC Master, you have these four screws at the bottom. And these two ridiculously long screws at the back here. So that's a screw and a half there. Possibly the longest one that I know of in any computer. OK, so that's the four screws out. We can turn it over. Um, and we can take the lid off. So inside any BBC Master, um, usually there is this battery pack at the side here. Um, this is usually dead by now. You've got these little AA batteries. These are Duracell ones. Um, there isn't any corrosion on this one that I can see. A little you know, corrosion at the ends there. Um, but these are usually always dead. So what we have to do is make a new battery pack for it. Just with three AA cells, um, a resistor and a diode, um, you can get a three-way battery holder and put it in here and then connect it onto where the battery connects to at the end. I've um, got some interesting things there. Two little bits of foam that have blocked off the cartridges. Not sure why, but don't want them. Keyboard connectors just here. Um, we've got space for some other ROMs to go in there. So this is a, an unexpanded BBC Master. There's not uh, any boards in here that is of interest. Um, generic standard BBC Master. Now, with BBC Micros and BBC Masters, the power supplies have um, capacitors that go across the mains to filter noise. Uh, if I plug this in, within a few minutes probably, or an hour or so, um, it's very likely we'll see it go bang um, and smoke will come out the back. Now, that's not the end of the world. Um, these capacitors are replaceable. It doesn't really do any other damage. Um, makes a little bit of a physical mess inside the case. Um, but those capacitors need changing. So before we do anything with these BBC Micros, um, we're going to be replacing those capacitors. So that's our first machine. That's the BBC Radio BBC Master. Nothing too exciting there. Let's put that one back together. So I'm going to be documenting all these uh, machines so that we know what we've got. 
as we go through and test them all. Won't bother doing that up too tightly because that'll be off again soon. So that's the BBC Master. Um, now, in amongst some of these, let's go to the, the standard BBC Micro. So this is a standard BBC Micro. Um, this is the original release, um, or one of the original releases. Um, this one again has got a BBC sticker, so this has again come from uh, the BBC in some way. What it was used for, I don't know. Um, one screw's already fallen out. Uh, the panel there where the speech upgrade ROM has been pushed out and has been uh, repaired there, so that's covering up that socket. Let's take this back off. Not doing these in any particular order. Theoretically, I should have done the BBC Micro first rather than the master. But I'm just going through the list and seeing what we've got. Um, hands are really dusty. So this is the BBC Micro. Let's take a look and see what's inside. Ah, now this is interesting because this isn't a standard BBC Micro. Um, this is what's so excited about um, BBC Micros and Acorn machines like this, uh, is that quite often it's what's inside the box that's really important. They all look pretty similar. The machine with its case and keyboard and the punch out bit of the side, they all look the same. Um, but when you open them up, that's when you start to learn things about them. This is what I find interesting. Um, so this is actually a BBC B+. And we can tell that because normally the EEPROMs are down the bottom here. Uh, on this one, we have them over here. So this is a BBC B+, Plus, um, with extra ROMs in it. Um, it has more sideways memory um, for putting um, uh, EEPROM images and things like that. Um, now this one, the keyboard is disconnected. So we can assume that this one is probably messed about with in some way or has been repaired or is not working. We'll find out. So that means this machine is probably um, not quite working, probably. That's quite a good indicator of there's some issues. So they've tested it and haven't quite put it back together properly. Um, but it does has, have the DDFS ROM uh, and it also has WordWise Plus and it has WordAid. So on the BBC Micro, you could put software into the machine internally on these EEPROMs. Um, and that made things much, much quicker. You didn't have to load from disk or tape. So DDFS um, is a uh, double density disk filing system uh, that was made by Watford Electronics, or in, th in this case anyway. Um, and many other people did the same sort of thing, but it allowed you to store more data on your floppy disks. The trouble is in doing that, it made that disk less compatible with other people. So if somebody ha had a standard DFS, they couldn't read your disks. So DDFS, had the ability to format disks to standard um, capacity as well, so you could share data still. But for your own disks, you could store more um, by doubling up. It's also got WordWise Plus in here. Now, WordWise is a word processor, you might have guessed. And just by typing style word, uh, you could get into a word processor immediately on your computer um, and start word processing. So that was a really good uh, EEPROM to have in your machine if you're using it for business purposes. Now, bearing in mind this come from the BBC, probably used in offices somewhere. Um, so that was a, a, a good addition to the machine. It's also got WordAid. Um, so that's a spell checker that worked with your word processor. That looks like about all it's got. It's also got the um, speaker disconnected as well. So maybe there's a fault with the keyboard. Maybe it's with the main board. Don't know. Um, but that's for the next set of tests. So there's probably about, um, uh, so there's one, two, um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's twelve there. Um, I think there's another box somewhere. I think it's that box there that has another load in it. Um, so there's actually quite a few of these machines um, been donated. And what's going to be interesting is going through these one by one and having a look to see what we've got. So that's the BBC Micro. We use these things a lot in the museum. Um, we have the classroom full of them um, and we teach kids programming uh, using BBC Basic. Uh, it's a very good, very approachable um, language, easy to understand, uh, and we use those a lot. So we have all our machines recapped because these suffer from the same problems I mentioned earlier um, with their power supplies um, and um, are really good for teaching. 
as they were designed, because the BBC Micro was a design for school's use. It was designed for teaching. Um, and the good things about a BBC Micro is are all these connections. They were really, really expandable. So we have here um, the tube connector, so we can add on a second processor. So we can have the main processor in the machine that becomes kind of a front-end processor for another one. So these use a 6502, you can have a Z80 on it. Um, you could even have an ARM processor uh, added on. And now there's Raspberry Pis that you can connect that can basically be any coprocessor that ever existed and more. They're quite amazing. Um, we've got user port there for connecting things like joysticks or mice and that kind of stuff. Printer, for connected printer, you might have guessed. Um, disk drive connector there. So let's put that one over here. That's another BBC. I might be getting all dirty. Right, this is interesting. Um, not that, that's the um, Sinclair Spectrum Plus 2. We'll come on to that. Uh, let's have a look at this thing. Ugh. So, again, a bit grubby. Now, this looks a little bit like a PC, but you'll see similarities with the keyboard of the BBC Micro, with the red keys at the top, and that one. What this actually is, is a BBC Micro built into a third-party case. So, we have a standard BBC keyboard, we have a case here that allows you to put two disk drives into it, um, and this all bolts onto the standard BBC Micro chassis. So at the bottom here, you might be able to see there this difference in colour. That's the original base of the BBC Micro, um, and this is what you bought. This is the expansion case um, that allows you to build it into what looks like a PC. So something like that with a monitor on top looks a little bit more PC-like. And also what it did is it built your, PC, your disk drives into the machine, so it was sort of nice and all in one, um, didn't have cables going everywhere. The trouble is, in my experience, because I did have one of these cases, um, there was a little bit too much in that case um, for the case to actually be able to vent the heat from. Uh, so I had a lot of trouble with mine overheating because the drives were generating heat, the power supplies in there generating heat, and it was just too much for it. Um, but let's have a little look to see what's in there. Because people that had a Vigling case for their machine quite often had them expanded uh, to the nth degree as well. So let's have a little look. So we have the bottom of the machine here. You can see that um, we've got this connector that goes inside. This is drawing power off of the power supply into the disk drives. And we can also see there's a connector there that is connecting the disk drives directly to the machine. Um, we don't seem to have any screws holding that on, as is the case with many BBC micros. If you had screws holding the lid on your case, you weren't a proper BBC Micro user, so the saying goes. Let's see what we've got at the back. So we've got a couple of screws at the back there. Let's undo those. Okay, so there is the machine in its goodness. Let's take the lid off and because there's lots of wires joining these together, we have to be quite careful. Um, so, we can now see both parts of the machine in their separate halves. Uh, let's let's get that in the right place so the camera above can see. Um, so, yeah, here we go. Disk drives in that part of the machine, uh, and then the standard BBC Micro base there. So this all looks pretty much the same as the other one did. This is a, an original BBC Micro, um, the standard model uh, B, issue 7 there. This is its power supply. Um, so the previous one, the BBC B+, Plus, we saw that had the ROMs in this area here. Um, this is the original configuration where you had them at the bottom. Um, and actually, unfortunately, it's pretty generic. Um, we've got the operating system ROM in there. Um, we have the DFS chip, we've got BASIC. Um, this chip here, I can't quite see, it's probably something like VIEW. Um, now, VIEW and WordWise were two competing word processors for the BBC Micro uh, back in the day. Um, this over here is the, um, the, uh, the, the disk drive controller. Um, that's an Intel 8271 chip. This is a ceramic one in there. Um, the processor for this machine is a 6502, which is in the middle there. Um, these chips here, these are uh, 6522s. They're called VIAs. Um, they controlled things like the printer port um, and the keyboard and things like that. So, yeah, pretty standard on this one. It's uh, just a, a normal BBC Micro, but put into the Viglin case. Um, so let's get that one 
put together and put that one aside. I think actually with these, once they're scrubbed up a little bit, um, they're actually going to be quite good. Oh, no, not there. We need to put the screws in the back. Um, so they're going to look all right. They might look a little bit yellowed, um, but they should look a lot cleaner. We'll have to be careful with this because there's no screws in the front there. So we'll have to make sure we don't split the case apart. Okay. So there is the Viglin cased BBC Micro. So there's not too many of these existing. So let's put that one over there. Okay. Um, let's have a little look in one of these boxes. Um, <laughs> so one thing we can see here is a Spectrum. It's a bit poorly, to say the least. Um, it has the additional upgrade of, um, what is that? Is that Dumbo? I'm not sure. Um, so, Dumbo stickers at the top there. No keyboard though, that's all been taken out. But it does have a main board, although this, um, this has been uh, butchered a little bit. So there's a UHF modulator uh, that would normally go up here. Um, that's missing, clearly. Um, it's an issue two board. It's got the little dead bug mod on the chip there. Um, this is the RAM in here. Uh, not a lot to say really. Standard issue two board, um, but with no keyboard or anything else. This is probably useful as a spare part to have around just in case we end up with a board um, that's dead. So that will go into the spares collection. Uh, what else we got here? Pinball Fantasies. For what machine? Can't see it. Look on every side, can't see what machine it's for. Um, ah, this is from the Amiga Chaos Pack and not for resale. Um, so, yep, Amiga software there. Amiga software came on three and a half inch floppy disks. However, we seem to have extra floppy disks in here. Who knows what they're for? Very interesting. Um, yeah. This to AGA, so this is for things like the Amiga 1200. So what we'll be doing with this is we'll be checking our collection uh, and see what we have. Um, if we already have this, we're going to check for condition, see if this one is better than ours. We might have just the discs, um, or we have the box, and maybe the discs don't work. But we'll be checking and comparing, um, and if we haven't got this, it'll be added to the collection. Um, if we do have it, then this will go on eBay um, to benefit the museum. So that's Pinball Fantasies there for the Amiga. So I'm guessing that probably this is too. Syndicate from Bullfrog. Um, another big box game for the Amiga. Um, also a not for resale package. And again, we've got the floppy disk there. And we'll be doing the same with those. So we'll be checking to see if we have Syndicate in the collection, which I'm pretty sure we do. Um, but it's always nice when we get the opportunity to look to see what we have and to see if this copy is better than ours, in better condition. So they will be checked out. Um, so these are LVL joysticks. Um, so I actually haven't seen the LVL joystick box. Um, this is interesting with the artwork that we've got on there. Uh, let's put that down on the table so we can see it. Um, so that kind of artwork is not one that I've seen before, but we have the LVL joysticks. And in fact, actually, when I look in the box, it's not the joysticks anyway. This is a box of stuff. Kind of interesting. So we have a, an early BBC mouse uh, made by AMX. So that connects to the user port that I told you about earlier on the BBC Micro. Um, interesting design of mouse. It has a, a metal roller ball. Um, you can see that there, and moves around as you would normally expect, uh, but with these three buttons actually on the top like that. So good mouse though, quite reliable. If we find those ones in a collection, we're pretty sure they'll work. Um, certain other mice we find, um, their balls have all gone sticky with age, but then, you know, happens to us all. Um, anyway, uh, here we go with a Watford light pen. This is pretty cool. So this is 
the light pen that Watford Electronics made for the BBC Micro. It would connect to the uh, analog port of the BBC Micro and allow you to use a light pen on that machine. Um, don't know whether we have one of those in the collection or not. So that is something we'll be definitely checking and adding if we don't already. Better wire, don't want that. Um, now then, we mentioned earlier, let's just grab it again, the BBC Micro and this little panel just here. So this was uh, used to, or was intended to be a cartridge upgrade for the speech synthesizer that was in the machine. machine. You could add two speech chips into the BBC Micro and you could have a phone M cartridge that gives it extra things that it could say that plugged into the front. But that never actually happened. Acorn never actually produced those cartridges. So the slot was there to use, um, but they never produced the hardware to go in it. Instead, what happened was companies like Viglin, and you'll know that name from the machine we saw earlier, the Viglin case, they produced a third party socket that would connect a socket that plugged into that hole um, and then it would go over to the ROM sockets at this end of the machine and it would allow you to plug in these kind of little cartridges that you can see there. Now, these cartridges plugged into the socket and you would take them apart and you would put an EEPROM inside with your software. And that meant you could plug any number of different bits of software into your machine so that they were just there to use immediately. Um, and they had these little cases, or stands I should say, sorry, that you could put at the side of your desk and have all your cartridges nicely um, stored away in those holders. Put another one on the end there with that one there. Brilliant stuff. So they were an expansion system uh, for the BBC Micro. Um, third party, not the original intention for that socket. Um, we have little bits and pieces here of that as well. So that would go over the socket um, and this would slot into it to protect it so when it was in use we didn't get dust in there um, but the actual upgrade itself is not here so let's put those back in our box we'll be making a comparison with what we have on our website later on just keep digging um, hmm. this is interesting Ooh. Uh, so this is Seventh Guest. This is a PC CD-ROM game. It's, um, it's not a, a version that I recognise, actually. This might be an early release of it, not sure. But it's in a really interesting sleeve. So you've got this kind of book feel to it. Even the edges kind of all got lines on them. So it looks like a book. And then as we open it here, um, we have the CD-ROM on this side. Oh, looks like we have the CD-ROM in it as well. Um, two CD-ROMs, another one there. We have this little door that we can open. Um, ah, which has the making of seventh guest video. Oh, no, it doesn't. Doesn't, oh, I got it. Um, if anybody has a making of seventh guest video, we'd like it on VHS. Um, and then we have a seventh guest patch disc. I'm not quite sure what that's about, um, but some sort of download to, to patch something within the game. That's a really nice presentation style of the uh, of seventh guest game. That's cool. I don't think we have that in the collection, so that will definitely be going in there. A little bit faded, um, some faded, nice and bright on the back, but faded on the front, but really, really cool. So that's seventh guest. Brilliant. Um, Another game here, oh no, it's not a game, it's uh, Deluxe Paint 2. So this is a painting program. Now this is either for the Amiga or the PC. Um, let's have a look. Ah, so this is for the PS2 AT XT compatible, 286 or 386. Um, so this is the PC version of Deluxe Paint 2, enhanced. Um, and this comes on three and a half inch floppy disk. You've got your manual there, uh, you have some sort of back up there on five and a quarter inch disc. Uh, that can't be an entire backup, but anyway. So we've definitely got this for the Amiga. Um, whether we have it for the PC or not, I don't know. We'll have to check that. A little bit dusty. When I say a little bit, I mean very dusty. Um, that's that one. 
Let's move on to another box, see what we've got here that might be a bit more interesting. Um, what's over here? Ah, uh, and I think this is the, it's the box only. Well, at least it feels like it. Yeah, just a cardboard box. Um, this is the box for the Aztec Sound Galaxy Pro 16. So this is a nicer sound card for the PC. Really good card back in the day. Relatively cheap in comparison with what's the other brands. Um, so, yeah, we've moved on, obviously, quite a lot since then in terms of sound technology. That's the Sound Galaxy Pro. Hopefully, um, we have a couple of PC machines down here of that kind of era. So hopefully the card might be in that machine and with any luck, the drivers and things could be in these boxes. So, an empty box, but never mind. So let's have a look down here. Ah, now this is very cool. Video Blaster by Creative Labs. This is the early packaging uh, for Creative Labs stuff. They had quite a, a look to their packaging after a while, but this is early. Um, so yeah, the Creative Labs Video Blaster. It feels quite heavy, so I'm hoping that it's actually all there. Uh, again, very dusty, so we'll have to give that a clean. Let's see, this is where we find out it's something completely different. Oh, no, I don't think. Tempera, special edition for Sound Blaster and Video Blaster. Video Blaster software disc. Um, Tempera, the ultimate personal imaging tool for presentations, publication, and commercial design. So actually, it does look with the breakout cable and everything else that we do indeed have a video blaster. That's very cool. It's not often that we find these kind of cards in their boxes. Um, usually we end up with an empty box with some stuff in it and we find a card in the machine and slowly over time we get them together as a complete package. Um, but to have all this together in one go is great. So I'm doing this from memory, but if I remember rightly, this is uh, an expansion video card. So it would connect to your existing uh, video card via the feature connector here. Um, and it would allow you to add on um, more advanced uh, graphics features. And it would also feed through. So you have the VGA input here that would come from your card and then you'd have VGA out as well. So it probably also adds on the uh, sound ability there at the top with your probably audio in and audio out. Not sure, um, but from memory, something along those lines. But the idea of expanding your PC with a second video card that adds on extra features uh, was not uncommon at that time. So let's put that back in the box. Have we got a date on any of this? So that is dated 1992, that thing there. So this is approximately that kind of vintage. If we look at the thing here, full motion digital video in a window. Uh, computer generated graphics and text overlay, scaling from full screen to icon size, um, control of hue, saturation, brightness and contrast. Um, so yeah, at the time, it doesn't sound much now, but at the time these would have been fairly advanced features. So that's the Video Blaster, that's a really nice addition. Um, we definitely haven't got one of these in this condition in our collection, so really pleased with that. So let's put that back, we shall give it a delicate clean up and put it into the collection. So we have quite a lot of magazines and things as well. Um, so this is Micro User. Uh, Micro User magazine was a really important magazine for BBC Micro users. Um, this is um, started at volume two number one so we probably have volume one over there somewhere. Um, but yeah it's a good magazine with a lot of information um, about effectively what is now the history of the BBC Micro, what came out and when. Um, so we use the news in these uh, quite a lot to figure out what was going on in computing history back at this time um, for all the different computers that we have. And more than that, what we're doing now is taking things like Popular Computing Weekly, um, scanning those and putting them on the website, but also indexing them. So the news articles in there become part of our timeline. So as you search our timeline, it will reference various news articles on our website. So that's something that's going on. Um, it's a massive process, uh, so it's gonna take a very long time. If anybody wants to help us do that, it can be done from anywhere. Um, please do let us know. You just need an internet connection, which you've clearly got. 
So, those micro user magazines, they will end up um, probably going on eBay. We already have the whole collection anyway. Uh, let's find another box. So this is um, what is left of a BBC Master Compact. Uh, now the BBC Master Compact was one of the last versions of the BBC Micro um, and this is effectively a little bit like um, the Vigling case that we saw in that you have a unit here with the power supply in it and the two disk drives um, and you would have a separate keyboard um, which was in fact the majority of the computer, the processor and everything was in there. Um, but so far all we have is the unit itself. There would normally be a front panel across here um, with the Acorn logo on things like that. So that's all we have right now. But that's part of a BBC Master Compact. Let's move that down here. Another bit of software out of the box. Uh, so this is the collector's edition of Prince of Persia. Um, so you can see that just there. So this is for the PC. It includes Prince of Persia 1 and 2 and the making of Prince of Persia. Um, doesn't feel like a great deal in the box. But, ah, we have the golden ticket. I mentioned that on the front there. So, uh, for entry into the exclusive once in a lifetime competition, um, that may have closed by now. Um, it's great, it's got this really kind of reflective front to it, so you can't copy it. Lovely stuff. Um, but you can send that in for a grand draw, so that's there. Um, Windows 95 and 3.1 instructions. The original disc, if we got the disc in there, yeah. Um, so this has got the game on it, um, and it also has the making of Prince of Persia. So again, I don't know whether we have that particular edition of it. I know we certainly have Prince of Persia, but we will be checking, comparing, because this has got quite a lot of sun fading on the top there. Um, ours might also have the same. It might be sun faded on the front, or it might be a crushed box. Um, we're just going to make that physical comparison with what we have. Um, and then go from there. So we have lots of these. So these are just standard disk drives uh, for a BBC Micro. Um, this will connect to the disk drive connector at the bottom of the BBC Micro. Five and a quarter inch disks in the front there. Um, and then what we have, later disk drives, had a 40 and 80 track switch. So you could read both 40 track and 80 track versions of discs. Um, this one's made by Watford Electronics, so that's a third party drive, but they were all much of a muchness. Um, did the same thing. We have a number of these. Um, this one's actually pretty good by the look of it. Um, little clean up, that's probably in good working order, but many of the ones we have are quite rusty on top and have been stored outside. Um, we tend to find that disc drives stored outside don't fare very well. Um, the heads on them and things don't like that kind of change in temperature um, or uh, humidity, so they quite often don't work. But this one doesn't look too bad. Let's put that over there. So this is kind of interesting. This is almost certainly, put that there, um, almost certainly an EEPROM programmer. Um, now, it would have connected via this connector there, mains at that point. What it connects to, I don't know. It looks pretty much homemade. Um, so these sockets here would be where you put your EEPROM in it. But these look like, um, yeah, they look like 28 pin sockets. So it would do up to 27128, that kind of thing. Um, but that 2764s and 27128s were just what BBC Micros used. Um, so that was good, but being homebrew, whoever built it, knew exactly what these LEDs and these switches did. We have no clue. But it's interesting, it's a nice little um, homemade EEPROM programmer. So that will probably go into the collection because it's unique and it just shows what people used to do. Buying your own EEPROM programmer was quite expensive. Um, you could knock one up from circuit diagrams that were in various magazines at the time, um, the Maplin magazine and ETI, that kind of thing. Um, they all had circuit diagrams for your own homemade EEPROM programmers. That's probably what this is. But it's difficult to tell. With no documentation, um, you have no real idea. So, another interesting addition to the BBC Micro. Um, 
<laughs> these are very useful to us. Um, these are unused three and a half inch DSDD discs. So these are the double density discs, the low density versions, um, using things like Amigas, BBC Micros also use them. Um, these would hold 720K uh, and are becoming a bit trickier to find. Um, there seems to be a few on eBay at the moment, um, so somebody's probably found a warehouse full. But, um, but yeah, this sort of thing are always useful. When we're putting software onto discs, you never know if you're using a second-hand disc whether that disc is actually okay or not, or whether it's your process that, that is at fault. So having new ones where you're pretty sure that they're going to be in good condition is always really useful. So they're good, very useful. Okay, so this kind of looks like the same kind of floppy drive casing um, that we saw earlier on the disc drive. But actually, this is a Music 500. Um, you can see it just under the dust there, there you go. Um, so this is a Music 500 interface. Again, it's for a BBC Micro. It would connect to the one megahertz bus port. So you've got this longer connector there that connects to the one megahertz bus. Um, that basically brought out um, a lot of the pins on the main processor, the 6502, the address bus, um, data bus, and the control lines, that kind of thing, um, to allow you to add other memory map devices. Um, so inside this is a board that has um, another sound chip. Um, a one that was more capable than the one that was inside the BBC Micro at the time. Um, and it allowed you to create music. Um, so that's the Acorn um, Music 500. So this is actually an official Acorn upgrade for your machine. That's cool. Again, we have these. This one's a little bit rusty. Um, but because there's no moving parts in this, even though it's a little bit rusty, it probably works just fine. Aha. Now then, this is a what we lovingly call a cheese wedge. Um, this is an interface that went next to your BBC Micro. So if I put this on the table here and put our BBC Micro next to it, you can see there that it's nicely designed to expand your system, sit on the side there, and this cable would go underneath the machine and connect in at the bottom uh, into the same, in this case, one megahertz bus port, because I thought this would be something like um, a 6502 coprocessor or a Z80 coprocessor, but actually it's not. Um, it's the Teletext adapter. Um, so the Teletext adapter allows you to receive Teletext pages that were broadcast over the air, but this can be connected to an aerial, um, and that would allow the machine to decode the Teletext into your BBC Micro so that you could download pages and things. Um, in the UK, there is no analog TV transmissions anymore, so sadly this is not going to work. Um, however, there are various people doing very clever things um, with uh, Raspberry Pis to basically recreate that whole system, uh, allowing you to access Teletext pages from the past, which is really, really cool. Incredibly dusty, um, but again, something we already have in the museum. Um, we have, I think we have all the BBC um, wedges of this type, so um, that will be going on eBay at some point. Okay, so, let's have a look at this. Oh, right, okay, so this is no longer Acorn related. Um, this is Sinclair Spectrum related. Um, so we have the Multiface One. Uh, this is an upgrade for your Sinclair Spectrum. It would plug into the back of it, um, and it will allow you um, to do various things um, and possibly even help you um, use software that wasn't quite illegal. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but that's a very useful little interface. Again, we do have one, we have one boxed, um, but it's good to see. This is interesting. We do not have one of these in the collection. This is a Disciple. Um, so this is a disc interface for the Sinclair Spectrum. Don't know a great deal about it myself. I'm no major expert, um, but I know this is a device that we don't have in the collection for sure. Um, not that I've seen anyway. Um, and is a nice third-party upgrade. So again, your Spectrum sits just here, um, like a docking station. Um, you can still bring out the, the connector at the back there, uh, joystick interface there, probably sound, disc interface there to add a floppy drive to it, um, joystick there. So yeah, great little addition to the collection there. I don't think there's that many of these, so really pleased to find that. Let's put the multi-face in there. And put that over here. Ah, 
and on the same lines, look at that, a boxed ZX microdrive. Um, so where have we got here? This is um, Games Workshop, this came from. Um, cost £29.95, um, and that, if it is in there, which it feels like it is, um, is the microdrive add-on for your Sinclair Spectrum. Although you'd need another interface as well. Um, so that's the actual unit itself. That's the microdrive. The microdrive cartridge goes in the front there. Um, this is a microdrive itself. So that little tiny cartridge there has an endless loop of tape um, in that cartridge. Let's put that back in there to protect it. Um, but you'd need the plus one interface to be able to use that with your Spectrum. So, cool. Nice microdrive box, microdrive for the Sinclair Spectrum. Ah, this is interesting. So, this is another multi-face uh, for the Sinclair Spectrum. But this one's boxed. So I'm not quite sure why there's two. Kind of unusual. Um, but this one doesn't seem to have any branding on it. Oh, it has on the back. It doesn't have its uh, multi-face logo on the front there. Made by Romantic Robot Limited. Brilliant name for any company. Um, no logo. But it looks pretty much unused. It looks really mint. Um, there seems to be two sets of instructions. So that might make sense as to why there is another one without a set of instructions or without a box. So... That's very cool. Again, we do have a box one, um, so this will um, be on our eBay page soon-ish. So while we're on the Spectrum thing, let's have a look at this. So this is a Spectrum Plus 2, or at least it's the box for one. Uh, let's open this up. Doesn't quite feel as heavy as it should. Oh. Yeah, power supply missing. But this is the Spectrum Plus 2. Uh, really nice condition, actually. That's beautiful. Um, quite often on these, the Sinclair red logos and things um, start to rub off as people handle it. Um, but that does look in really, really nice condition. Um, sadly, there should be a power supply that goes in there. That's missing. Um, and the manual and the tape and things like that. Um, so it's just the machine itself, but that's pretty good. We've almost certainly got a spare power supply that we can put with it. Um, but yeah, that is in really, really, really nice condition. Nice. So that's the grey version of it. There's another version as well, which has a much darker case um, and some electrical or electronic differences to the machine as well. Let's put that one away. You can tell by picking up the box, because the power supply is quite heavy, that something wasn't right. But that's not a problem. We can probably add a power supply to it. Um, there is actually, let's keep going with the whole Spectrum thing. <laughs> There's a box here. Um, so that's an original Spectrum box. Uh, pretty battered though. Um, and, and it doesn't have a Spectrum in it. It actually has a ZX81. Uh, so this is a, a great little computer, a lot of personal um, memory for me in this one. It looks like the case or the keyboard might have been replaced at some point. Um, it hasn't been very well done, there's a little notch out the top there. Um, but the ZX81 computer for me was a machine that I got um, in 81 and built it with my dad. Um, it was a kit and we made that and when we plugged it in it worked. It's quite amazing that it did work, um, but it did. And for me, this machine is responsible for getting me involved in electronics and computing and the career I've had and now the museum. Um, so, yeah, not in the right box, but it's kind of cool to find one. Um, no power supply or anything, but they take a standard 9 volt um, sort of unregulated power supply. So that's easy to do. And it just connects to a UHF via this lead. So it goes into the back of a standard TV um, or a standard TV for the day anyway. Um, you'll need to find a nice CRT to connect it to. Sometimes it works with LCDs. So some, it works with some um, LCD TVs. Uh, you just have to try it and see how it goes. Um, the band that this uh, transmits on is actually quite a narrow one. So when you're auto-tuning on TVs, sometimes they miss it because they just skip over it and, and you probably need to use your manual tuning. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't want to know at all. It's just too narrow. Um, but worth a go. 
Uh, yeah, brilliant machines. 1K of memory as it stands, right there. Little touch sensitive keypad. Um, yeah, black and white, no sound, but really, really important. It's a machine um, in the UK uh, that really did change the face of computing. Really great machine. So, that's a ZX81 in a Spectrum box. Strange but true. Um, let's have another look. What have we got here? Ah, so this is kind of good. The joystick, oh, it's not the joystick. Um, it's the joystick box um, for a Spectrum Plus 2. But actually what's inside it is cassettes. So we have the original Curry's cassettes here. Um, so if you bought your machine from Curry's in the UK, they bundled some games for it. Uh, at the time, it's got Defender there, but Defender, D-E-F-E-N-D-A. So it's not the actual Defender. Um, really important there. Gets around all copyrights doing that. Um, so a couple of Curry's games there. Oh, actually, yeah, the same. The rest of the box has got the same Curry's games in. Uh, and then, uh, what's this one? <coughs> Millionaire by Incentive. Project Future. Then a couple of just blank tapes with other games on. Probably doesn't really say so it's interesting when we have tapes that come in to look at them they might have been pirated games but sometimes there's a possibility it's the only version left of it um, if they were a very very low run game sometimes it's hard to find those so we are still interested in these um, although we don't preserve them in the same way as we do with these um, now these are in good condition the cases are nice so we might look at these and see if they're any better than our ones um, but we don't preserve these in the same way but we do um, have a look to see what software's on there to make sure there's nothing that's gone missed by anybody else. So let's put those back in there. So not the joystick, but interesting nonetheless. Manual for the original Spectrum. So that's good. OCP Art Studio, various... Um, ah, so this is good. The newsletter of the Independent Disciple User Group. Um, so you saw the Disciple interface earlier. Um, these are some newsletters for it. Uh, that sort of thing is gold dust. Um, for a lot of these things, the use of them was relatively low in comparison with the sales of the machine. So when we've got um, newsletters um, and user group information, that is like gold dust to us, really important. So these will definitely be put into the collection um, and archived along with everything else because this information supports the hardware. It's not all about hardware. These are what was missing from the box that you saw down there. Uh, they are both the same, so that's strange. But this is the user manual for the Spectrum Plus 2, so we can reunite that with the box. Bit bent up, but the Spectrum ROM disassembly, we need to flatten that out. Um, this was a Bible to many people. Anybody that was uh, writing software seriously for the Spectrum um, needed this book. Um, it was complete disassembly of that ROM, as it says on the cover, obviously, but it gave you all the inside information you needed to know to write really good assembly language code on the Spectrum. A lot of game programmers use that book. Supercharge Your Spectrum, another Melbourne book. Um, and again, talking about the machine code programming of the Spectrum. Two good books there. This is the manual, or the later manual, for the ZX81. So that can go with the ZX81 we have. Um, the early ones were uh, spiral bound, had a ring spiral bound on them. These are the later uh, bound ones. And this is the manual for the Spectrum Plus. So the Spectrum Plus sat between the standard Spectrum that came out with the rubber keys and the one you saw, the Plus 2 earlier. Um, hadn't found the Spectrum Plus. May or may not be here, I don't know. Um, but that goes with that. And then we have another cassette there. Genie 128. So that goes with the 128 Genie. Um, so we saw the multi-face uh, 128. Uh, this is the software that goes with it. So this whole process of going through all of this, looking at what we've got, um, and then reunited those tapes and those user guides um, and the books that we've found with their original items is really, really important, but incredibly time consuming. Um, but So that will go with the multi-face because that's the software for it. So that's good stuff. And we have various... Sort of, uh, these are invoices and things. Interesting to see the way that... So this paperwork here has been wrapped around that and it's actually made it that same colour as this. Weird. So quite often... Yeah, this is, this is that. So quite often you get sort of printouts of things 
um, which we'll take a, a, a look at. Um, if it's personal, um, then we just get rid of it, shred it. Um, but if it's actually supporting information, we might keep it for the device or we might scan it. Depends. Um, look at this. This is quite good. Curry's electrical store. So this is the receipt. Um, what is it for? Doesn't actually say what item it's for. 129.99. So probably for the Sinclair Spectrum Plus Two. So that's really cool because we now have um, you know, the original uh, receipt from Curry's for that machine. So that's another bit of sort of the in the history that goes with that machine. So that will be put with the machine as well. So let's put this away. We will reunite that stuff later. How are we doing for time? I mean, this is something that can go on forever. You'll see that we haven't really touched this pole yet. We also haven't powered anything up. Um, now, powering this stuff up is uh, a little bit more critical. Um, you don't really want to just plug these things in and hope. Uh, in the perfect world, what you want to do um, is bring them up on a power supply that you can turn the voltage up on so that you don't shock it into life again. Um, when you do that, the power supply capacitors is below. Um, so there is a bit more of a process to powering these things up and checking them, but we will get to that. Um, at the minute, we're just assessing to see what kind of thing we have here. So this is interesting. So this is a tablet device that you would use with your BBC Micro and it connected to the user port of the machine via that connection there. So this was used quite a bit in schools um, to make using certain software easier to use. Um, this is the graph pad. There was also another version of it um, that was used in schools as well. Can't quite remember the name of that. So that's the graph pad. Again, we do have one for the BBC Micro, uh, but always good to see. <laughs> this is quite nice. Um, this is um, a cassette player. It's a pretty big and chunky one, made by Rank Aldis, um, and and it has the connections there for the remote, the aux, and the uh, mic. Uh, so you could connect this to your computer. Um, so you have the cassette there. It's got a TDK cassette in it. Brings back some memories. Um, no idea whether it works. Quite often with cassette players, because they have belts inside, um, they've all perished by now. So you press play, it actually doesn't do anything. Um, they are repairable. Um, oh, great little carry handle there. Um, yeah, are repairable. But actually, for a lot of what we do these days, um, we load software into these machines via MMC cards, um, SD cards, and CF cards, and all that kind of modern technology. Um, so we have one of these out to show people what it was like, but we don't necessarily use it on a day-to-day -day basis because it's just not as practical as using modern techniques. Um, so anyway, yeah, nice cassette deck there. Ah, saying that, I said I hadn't seen, oh, and there's another one. I said I hadn't seen a Spectrum Plus uh, yet, but actually I've just seen the box for one, and I've just seen two in this one. Um, so this has got US written on it. Um, so US usually means unserviceable um, and has almost certainly got some sort of fault with it. Probably quite repairable. Um, we'll have a look. Um, membranes tend to go on these. Uh, so the keyboard membrane uh, has tarnished probably over time and probably half the keys won't work. So you can get membranes for these. Um, you can repair them, just replace the membrane um, and it will be back in action. But they also suffer from RAM faults and things like that. Uh, so yeah, might need a bit of work. Well, this one definitely does. It says US, so I'm taking that means unserviceable. So that's one Spectrum Plus and another Spectrum Plus. Slightly nicer. This one was on top, so it's all dusty. This one looks a little bit better. Um, nice logo uh, at the bottom there. That's all in red and nice and clear. Um, this has also got US on it, um, so we'll have to see. So this is two of three. This is one of three. Um, ah, now in this box, we have an interface. So not quite sure what that one is. It's definitely for a Spectrum. Um, it looks like it has two connectors there. Um, could be a, possibly be a disk drive. I'm not sure. I have to look into that one. That's exciting. Oh, and another one. It has this button here, 
So not sure about those. I need to take the lids off of those, find out what they are by looking at the chips. Um, power supplies for our spectrums. Good stuff. So they can go there. We have our cassette leads and our aerial leads. They don't look like they've even been opened. Um, another set there. Our manual that we found earlier. Um, oh, hello. What's this? This is the MGT Plus D. This is interesting, um, although it's not actually there. Um, so issue one of that. Let's have a look. So the MGT Plus D, from my memory, is a disk interface, again, for the Sinclair Spectrum. Um, but it looks like we only have the cassettes and the manual. Now I'm wondering actually, there is, if we look at this, we have two tapes and they're both exactly the same. And we have the manual, but we have two of these units here. Yeah, these look like they're just blank. So if we have two tapes and we have two of these, I am wondering if this is actually the MGT plus D. Um, so MGT, if you recognise that name, um, are the company, it's, uh, Miles Gordon Technology is the name of the company, MGT, and they were responsible for the Sam Coupe. So it could be that these are disk interfaces. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, this isn't my area of knowledge. But bearing in mind there's two of those, and there are two of the tapes. It could well be. And actually it says here, MGT plus D, disk printer interface, ah, for the Spectrum 48K plus... Right, so I'm thinking that because that is roughly the same, numbers as, uh, same number of pins as a Centronics printer, that's your printer interface and that is your um, disk interface. This is almost certainly the MGT plus D. Now, I don't know if we have one in the collection. I'll have to go away and have a look. But if we haven't, this is really cool because um, there aren't that many of these. Not many people went to the extent of adding disk drives to their spectrums. Um, the later plus three had a three inch disk drive built in, um, but most people run them from tape at that time. This is really cool. So with the instructions there, probably those two there, we may well have ourselves the plus D interface if we haven't already got it. Another aerial lead. Oh, little Maplin uh, power supply there. Does anybody remember Maplin? Back in the days when it was good. So, little Maplin power supply, great stuff. So let's just put these back in the box. Okay. And then, oh, actually, you know, it's all starting to unfold now. So we have here a boxed Sinclair Spectrum. Let's carefully open that. The best way for taking machines out of their boxes is to let gravity do the work. Um, I've seen people trying to grab at the end and pull it out. Um, just put the polystyrene face or the open end face down. <laughs> Nearly dropped it. Um, put the uh, polystyrene face down and just let it fall out. That way you don't start picking at the polystyrene. Um, oh, hello. So this is a quite a nice... Um, Sinclair Spectrum. This is the original type with the rubber keys, 48K or 16. Let's have a look, 48K. Um, oh, BBC White City. Wow. So this was obviously also used by the BBC. That's kind of cool. Um, but it's been really well marked up. So you've got this positively identifiable mark on top there um, and some nasty yellow paint in the corner. That's a bit of a shame. Um, but it's kind of cool that it was used by uh, at the BBC at White City. Um, for why, I don't know. So that's the original uh, Sinclair Spectrum. So in the box we have, um, let's move that over. We have the original manual, the introduction guide. We've got the tape um, and we've got the power supply there. Um, the contents of the box, I don't know if you can see into this part here, um, where the PVC cable is eating into the polystyrene. So this is a preservation problem that we come up with a lot. Um, and we're trying to get our heads around it in a way uh, that allows us to still put these things back in their boxes but protect them. So now we separate any PVC cables via a polycarbonate bag. So we just put them into a bag and then put them back into the box. Um, because the 
basically the plasticizer uh, of the PVC cable, the, th the part that allows the plastic to remain flexible, because you don't want your leads just dead straight, um, the plasticizer starts to react with the polystyrene. And because polystyrene is a very low density um, form of plastic, it just starts to eat into it. And what happens in is you get this kind of um, clear goo that appears on the cable, um, and that is where that reaction has taken place. Now, we want to stop that as much as we can. Um, preser preserving plastics is not easy. You can't really preserve it forever. There is always degradation. Um, so we just want to try and slow it down as much as we can. So there is a quite a nice spectrum. Now, what is interesting about this spectrum, um, you know, we have plenty of them, but because it was used at White City, um, you know, it has a little bit of backstory. So that's kind of interesting to us. I would love to know what it was used for and why. So let's take our spectrum, put it back in the box. And there's the uh, card that you can send off to Sinclair Research um, to be told the latest information. No signing up on their website or anything. It was before all of that. Um, so let's put that down there. And then this is the box for the Spectrum Plus. Now I'm not going to open that because it is very clearly empty. So it's just the box and the polystyrene. Um, again, you've got some fading here. So this part has been in the sun um, and it's very dusty, but actually it's not, not too bad a condition. So um, that's the box for the Spectrum Pluses. And the other box that Spectrum Pluses came in were these standard brown cardboard box um, with these great Royal Mail labels that you can see there. Um, so you see those on them all the time. So these were just sent out mail order. And, and after telling you to let gravity do the job, I pulled it out of the box. Um, but to be fair, it was already half exposed. Um, so yeah, this is a Spectrum Plus, as we saw earlier. Good condition, nice red um, logo on there. Um, probably worth powering up and seeing if it works. So there you go, so that's that Spectrum Plus. Polly's all a little bit rough. But so actually I think this has been put in the box upside down. I think that goes there. I think that cable goes in there. And I think that goes on there like that. So that's the box as it should be. So I'm going to leave it there, I think. Um, I think we should bit a bit over that hour mark. Um, I've been talking a lot. All the dust is getting in my throat. Um, so I need to drink a water. Um, but, you know, it gives you an idea of the sort of thing that comes into the museum. So um, we're going to carry on going through this. Um, probably do another one of these videos, maybe in a bit more detail on specific machines. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for watching. I uh, hope you found it vaguely interesting. Um, Please excuse anything that I got wrong on it, but this was all off the cuff. Um, there's a lot of machines that come through our hands at the museum, um, so sometimes things get a bit mixed up, but you know, it's roughly there. Um, feel free to argue with me in the comments below. Um, you're probably right. Um, yeah, so we're going to carry on going through this stuff. There is still a lot to do, um, and uh, we'll come back to you with what we find. Um, if you'd like to see us do more of this, please do let us know. Um, this is the first one of these we've done. And, and if you have collections that you think should be in the museum, please do contact us. Um, we are really, really keen to hear from people. We do a brilliant job in preserving these machines um, and all the software and the documentation, everything that goes along with computing history. Now, I know I do say that myself, um, but it's not me. It's all the volunteers and the staff we have at the museum who have got everything invested in this. Um, it's their passion. Um, and that comes through in what we do. And whilst the bulk of it is stuff that we have um, that will be moved on um, to benefit the museum, uh, there are some really cool little bits in here that will add to our collection and make it all the better. So thanks for watching. Uh, please do support us on Patreon if you can. Um, you know, creating these videos takes time. Um, with your help, we can do more and we can show you what is going on at the museum behind the scenes um, as much as we can. We want you involved. So thank you very much for that. Stay tuned for probably the next installment of this. Thanks a lot.